So good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to uh, week two of Bluegrass Folk Music and Overdrive. Today's uh, featured instrument is a guitar, and we are extremely fortunate to have with us to demonstrate the guitar and to talk a little bit about it, the guitar and its history and, uh, in the music is Keith Edwards. Um, and Keith will be ably assisted on the bass fiddle today by Lillian Fraker. And we're extremely pleased that both Keith and Lillian could be with us today. Before I get started with a little, just a little history, a little sort of a continuation of uh, last week's presentation that I did, I just wanted a couple of announcements. Um, I think everybody knows this, but just want to mention there is no, no class next week, next Friday, uh, April 19th. Um, we'll be back here for the next classes, uh, Friday, April 26th. So there's no class next Friday on the 19th. On the 26th, we're having the fiddle presentation with Ambrose Verdebello. Um, I also want to mention that on Saturday, April 27th, the Hudson Valley Bluegrass Association, which is uh, involved in, in this presentation, uh, is sponsoring a concert at the Unitarian Fellowship uh, on South Randolph Street in Poughkeepsie. Um, it's Rob Ikes, Trey Hensley, and Mike Bubb. Uh, Rob Ikes is one of the great Dobro virtuosos, uh, resonator guitar virtuosos of uh, bluegrass and, and other musics. Um, and he's going to be playing with uh, Mike Bubb, who's a wonderful bass fiddle player, and Trey Hensley, who's a guitar player. Uh, it promises to be a really worthwhile show. Uh, Lynn Lipton has information, and there's information on the Hudson Valley Bluegrass Association website about that concert. Um, so with that uh, out of the way, I, I thought I would continue a little bit in uh, my, my discussion of sort of the Bill Monroe, uh, the history of Bill Monroe and how bluegrass got started. Last week I said that the sound that we now think of as bluegrass music hadn't quite gelled with the early 1940s edition of Bill Monroe and the Bluegrass Boys. Bill had developed his own dynamic new vocal and mandolin sound, uh, first with his brother Charlie and then with his own band, um, which then included mandolin, which Bill played along with fiddle, guitar, and a string bass. Um, and Bill had joined the Grand Old Opry, which was uh, the Nashville Radio Barn Dance program it was, uh, it's been referred to as the Mother Church of Country Music. Bill had been invited to join that in 1939. Um, but the sound, as we heard last week, wasn't quite yet what people normally think of when they think of bluegrass. What was missing was a sound that I think is now generally considered essential, the sound of the five-string banjo. Uh, so in the early 1940s, Bill hired his first banjo player, a fellow named Dave Aikman, who was a comedian who played the banjo, which was, I think, fairly typical at the time. Banjo players often tended to be comics. Um, Monroe may have hired Aikman as much for his comic skills as his banjo prowess, uh, since comedians were an important part of Bill's program in those days. Um, so Aikman recorded with Bill in uh, 1945, and his sound was not quite, I think, what Bill was looking for, but I wanted to give you a little bit of a the sound. This is a song called True Life Blues that Bill Monroe and the Bluegrass Boys recorded in 1945. <laughs> was one of String Bean's shining moments um, with, uh, with Monroe on record. A um, couple other interesting things about that particular track. It featured an accordion, um, and it featured uh, a female bluegrass boy, Wileen Forrester, who was, uh, I guess, can be regarded as one of the pioneering women of bluegrass, and she was a member of Bill Monroe and the Bluegrass Boys uh, back in the 1940s when the sound was just coming together. Uh, the accordion didn't last in Bill's band, but uh, Wiling began a tradition of women in bluegrass which has come to full flower today, certainly, and uh, we were very fortunate last week we had Tara Linhart uh, to demonstrate the mandolin, and uh, we're very fortunate today to have Lillian Fraker who will be playing the bass for us. Uh, women are important part of bluegrass uh, nowadays, and um, it kind of got started back in 1945 with Wiling Forrester. Um, so that was the sound 
before Bill Monroe hired Earl Scruggs. Uh, Earl brought a different set of banjo, different rhythm than, than, than what String Bean had that we just heard, and uh, he was uh, much more fluid and, and much faster. And his rhythm was different than, than what we just heard on that, too. And so when Bill hired uh, Scruggs, he also had in his band Lester Flat on guitar, who was uh, a preeminent vocalist, and a fiddle player named Chubby Wise. And that band is generally considered the first bluegrass band. Um, Monroe, uh, Chubby Wise on fiddle, Lester Flat on guitar, Earl Scruggs on banjo, and uh, Howard Watts on bass fiddle. Uh, those are the records that are considered sort of the iconic, really the first uh, recorded evidence of, of the sound that we now associate pretty clearly with bluegrass. Um, some of the recordings that, that, that really demonstrated this sound for the first time. Um, uh, Did I skip? Skip the winter Kentucky. Skip it? <laughs> skip it for now. I mean, that's actually, that, that's, uh, let's play Molly and Ten Brooks. This is Earl Scruggs. So obviously that, that, that's just got sort of this galloping rhythm to it. It's much uh, faster and, and uh, much more fluid than what String Bean was doing. Um, and it is said that when uh, Monroe would do that song on the Grand Old Opry, a live performance in, in Nashville, that the audiences insisted that Earl Scruggs play a banjo chorus after every verse. <laughs> so Bill, which is a long song to start with, um, but all they want, they couldn't get enough of that, that banjo sound. Um, let's get a little cabin home and go right to uh, Bluegrass Breakdown. This is another demonstration of Earl's banjo speed and finesse. <laughs> So the other members of the band didn't have any trouble keeping up with that. You just heard a little bit of Bill Monroe's mandolin playing. Uh, as I said, the audience at the weekly Grand Ole Opry shows couldn't get enough of that, especially that banjo sound. And other musicians were paying attention as well. Um, next week I'll talk about some of the bands that, that uh, began to follow in the pattern that was set by uh, Bill Monroe and Lester Flatt and Earl Scruggs. Um, but now I'm going to turn it over to Keith Edwards, who's got a really interesting guitar program. Uh, presentation for you. All right, thank you. I don't know what the definition of uh, interesting is, but we'll, we'll we'll see as we go along. So I'm very laid back, teacher by trade. So if you have uh, questions, comments, so forth as we go along, feel free to interject, ask. Just don't ask me to leave. I might my feelings might get hurt. Um, so I've been playing uh, bluegrass since uh, I was born, it seems. Uh, my father played the banjo, and uh, I was raised in a household where the theory was if it isn't bluegrass, it isn't music, period. And that was my dad. Um, and uh, he is still like that to this day. He's 79 and doesn't, doesn't listen to anything else. <laughs> Um, so I started playing the guitar and also the upright bass uh, when I was 12 years old and uh, have been playing in various bands uh, throughout my life and a couple of touring bands as well. Lily and I actually play together in a band and uh, we'll talk a little bit about that later as we go through. Um, so, you know, some of the early roots of, of bluegrass, obviously we're a, a country of immigrants and there was a lot of uh, different musical influences that came from other countries. 
then you had uh, some of this Appalachian sound and Southern sounds with the banjo and the fiddle playing. Um, and that, that was the main form of entertainment. And slowly and gradually, guitar got added in there, um, which was beginning to form the original sounds of, of bluegrass. So I wanted to talk about some of the pre-Bill Monroe uh, time that, that helped influence uh, bluegrass guitar playing before we actually get into bluegrass guitar playing, if that makes sense, sort of my, my thought today. So one of the first uh, superstars, uh, he was the biggest thing of his day and his time was Jimmy Rogers, uh, who played from 1897 to 1933 uh, in that time period. And his guitar playing uh, was definitely unique. He had his own sound, his own rhythm. And I wanted to bring up Jimmy Rogers because some of his style in his guitar playing, his strumming, is still found in bluegrass today. And oftentimes there are a lot of bluegrass bands that cover or sing his songs as well. Um, so he was one of the first guitar players who was prominent and popular. Um, what, what are you doing with that there? <laughs> Don't make me put you in a timeout, William. <laughs> Uh, he was one of the first guitar players that was prominent and popular who was really pushing um, hearing bass notes in the guitar. So a lot of people were just strumming in general back and forth. But Jimmy Rogers was a little different because he was, he was doing that kind of a thing. So you can hear the bass notes on the one and three. One, three. And so I got just a little clip of him. One of his many blue yodels. I think he had 19 different blue yodel songs, something like that, over his career. So this is blue yodel number one. He's from Texas, he's from Tennessee. He's from Texas, he's from Tennessee. He's from Delaware, that gal that made a record of me. And I guess that's all he has to say about that. <laughs> so again, you can see with his kind of playing, he's, he's playing in front of the hole of the guitar. So he's up in here and he's playing what would be the E and the A string when he's strumming. So he's up in here. So I'm going to sing some songs along the way. Um, and I thought, why not start with a Jimmy Rogers song? So this is actually, I don't have the words memorized. I've got a cheat sheet. This is Blue Yodel number three. Let me hear your G again. You're there. <laughs> All right, here we go. And I'm going to try and strum a little bit like he did. So I'm going to try and stay in front of the hole and do some of his kind of strum techniques. She's long, she's tall. She's six feet from the ground. She's long and tall. She's six feet from the ground. She's tailor made. Lord, she ain't no hand me down. She got eyes like a diamond. Her teeth shine just the same. She got eyes like diamonds. Her teeth shine just the same. She's got sweet ruby lips and a hair like a horse's mane. My attempt at yodeling. Yodeling, yodeling, yodeling. Every time I see you, mama, you're always on the street. Every time I see you, mama, you're always on the street. You hang around on the corner like a police on the beam. Every time I need you, woman, Lord, I always find you gone. Every time I need you, woman, 
I always find you gone Listen here, sweet mama You better put your air brakes on Yodel lady, hey, hey, yo, yo, yodel lady Thank you. So, again, his style, he, he is uh, accentuating those bass notes, a little... So a little different kind of strum technique, had his own sound. Uh, that's why he was uh, the man of his time. So we'll move on to the Carter family. So the Carter family was playing around the same time um, and also had become quite popular. And we talked about female influence uh, in music. Certainly the females uh, in this particular act definitely stood out. Um, and Mother Maybell Carter played the guitar um, and also did a lot of lead playing on the guitar. So not just strumming, but actually picking out the melody of the song. So you listen to some of their old recordings. That's her playing those things. So Carter family was uh, playing and recording from 1927 to 1956. Uh, obviously, there are no live videos of the three Carter family that, that I could find. But I did find a little reunion video of uh, two of them here. So they had done a, uh, a reunion album. And this was on one of the country music shows at the time, and they uh, did this song while the band is playing Dixie. So we've got just a snippet of Mother Maybell playing the guitar. So uh, they called that the scratch technique. Is you could see one, she's using a thumb pick, where um, Jimmy Rogers was using a regular pick. Um, she was from Eastern Tennessee, and a lot of Eastern Tennessee guitar players at that time played with thumb picks, not with guitar picks as we know them as today. Um, so we look at some later players, Lester Flat, who famous with Flat and Scruggs, like with a thumb pick. So her part of her scratch technique is she's actually got two picks, so she's got a thumb pick and then she's got one on her pointer finger as well. So that's how she's getting that um, strum technique going. And um, obviously she was extremely influential. Um, their music was very influential. Uh, a lot of people cover their material, a lot of people try and recreate her kind of playing style and sound. Um, and so I thought we'd pick out a uh, old song. I'm going to attempt to do it. Remember to tell your bass player what you're going to do and in what key. You <laughs> <laughs> made him promise. <laughs> bass players are so high maintenance. <laughs> I think I'm going to G. Okay, sounds like it. It is, if it would stop buzzing. We may be going to F. Oh. <laughs> All right. We'll do a little bit of this. It was a Carter family song. And later on, the 40s and 50s, uh, Flatt and Scruggs recorded this as well. And Earl Scruggs um, played this song three finger style. And it's called You Are My Flower. my flower 
in sound so um, in front of the hole to me it's a more mellow kind of sound and when I go behind it also has to do with the resonance of the guitar itself so I can get far more sound being back here than up in here uh, for a couple of reasons one again the vibration and so forth but also because you can hit it harder <laughs> So it's you know it's harder to it's harder to strum up here than it is. So it's you know it's a combination of honestly physics and uh, its ability to to vibrate. So thank you for that question. So one of the things I wanted to mention with uh, Mother Maybell is when she was picking, she was also strumming at the same time, which is very different than. Uh, what many people know was flat picking, which is picking out a song where there are a lot of individual notes. So she's sort of strumming and picking at the same time, which is what I was attempting to replicate there. All right. So a couple of the other um, acts I wanted to mention that became important during this time, sort of the pre- uh, quintessential 40s, 50s bluegrass were uh, a lot of groups where there were either two guitars or a guitar and a mandolin. So we had the actually the Monroe brothers, the Delmore brothers, and um, in both cases, uh, but I, I couldn't find a picture of guitar and mandolin. Um, both of them did have guitar and mandolin prominent. So the mandolin was taking most of the breaks obviously, and the guitar players were just doing a lot of that rhythm. But the rhythm style was slowly beginning to develop and change into what we know as today's bluegrass rhythm. Next, please. So I just wanted to touch base on the 40s and 50s. So again, you had, you know, Bill Monroe and the Bluegrass Boys over towards the Boston area. Uh, you had the Lilly Brothers, uh, who again started as a guitar, mandolin, uh, duet and then later on had their own bluegrass band. Um, you got another brother duet who were very popular at the time, the Stanley Brothers. Again, they're from the area of Virginia. Um, the brother who played the guitar also played with a thumb pick. So thumb pick style guitar playing was really popular during that, that era. 
um, Reno and Smiley, um, Don Reno and Earl Scruggs were the first couple to perfect three finger style banjo playing, which is what made that banjo sound different, um, which is what he had mentioned earlier. Um, and Don Reno was one of the, uh, Red Smiley was one of the first ones to really, what I call, lay into the guitar with these really heavy bass runs on the guitar. Uh, and we'll get into that a little bit as well. The other thing that changed is in 1931, um, the Martin Guitar Company invented a new type of guitar called a dreadnought style guitar which is the kind of guitar I'm playing today. I wish mine was a 1931. I would have, um, I'd have security all around me. <laughs> uh, but mine's a 1947. It's a, it was a good year. Um, Thank you. <laughs> so, and the word dreadnought, I looked it up, it actually uh, comes from, it has to do with like the military. Oh, and, and, and Yes, ships. yes, right. So, but one of the things it did, you saw the Jimmy Rogers guitar, which if we were to compare them side by side, was a smaller bodied guitar. They had guitars at that time, um, what they call like double O, triple O. Uh, some people call them parlor guitars. They were sort of smaller in body, smaller in size. They didn't have as much bass and they weren't as loud. Um, and bluegrass started getting louder because you know, when you had to compete with the banjo, which is naturally loud, um, you know, a dreadnought style guitar that had more vibration could then project more sound, became very prominent in, in guitar, guitar playing in bluegrass. So that's why um, this was a major step in sort of the helping to change the style because this guitar allowed you to do different things that those parlor guitars did not allow you to do. So some different playing styles. Um, so we've got what we had talked about, kind of that punchy rhythm uh, with some of the bass runs. You're gonna make me dizzy. You keep. Making I'm making me. myself dizzy. <laughs> <laughs> it's very moving the way they're doing that. Uh, there's some three finger style guitar playing as well, um, cross picking and then flat picking. So we'll touch base on a little bit of each of those. Um, I don't do three finger style guitar playing. Wish I do, uh, wish I did, but I don't. And I think the the next slide, I think we've we've got a little example of that. Um, it's actually Flat and Scruggs. Flat and Scruggs had a uh, television show on for many years, and this is Earl Scruggs. Do you want to go on to the next slide? Yep. Play that. Yep. So here's one, Georgia Buck. <laughs> sure we got the clip with a little bit of the hand in there, right? Um, so this three finger style guitar playing was very popular in bluegrass still is today, especially um, for gospels, gospel songs that seems to be used a lot. Um, Merle Travis, um, Chet Atkins, some of the people who really perfected that and, and people took off with it. So. Uh -oh. What are you doing to me? Nothing, I didn't touch anything. <laughs> <laughs> You're dying. So, it's all dying over there. Um, I'll look for something else to do. That's all right. Um, so, we got that. The, the next slide, using your imagination, had some pictures of some different famous guitar players. And one of the ones I want to mention is um, George Shuffler. So, George Shuffler uh, is not as well known as he probably should be. Uh, in my opinion. Um, he was a excellent, excellent bass player, phenomenal bass player, but he also uh, perfected something called cross-picking on the guitar, which really takes the idea of a three-finger style banjo type playing or that guitar and doing it with one string. So rather than picking out individual notes, 
he wanted to try and make it sound more like banjo playing in a sense with the pick. So what he did is he came up with this thing called cross picking, which is a one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two. So I'm going to take a song. Oh, it's back. Um, it's back. <laughs> so uh, let's play. Um, let's just play Wildwood Flower, mm -hmm. and we'll uh, see Angie. Yeah. Okay. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to start playing Wildwood Flower. The Carter family did it. Mother Maybell's most famous song on the guitar. If you don't play it on the guitar, people mock you. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm going to play it a little bit like Mother Maybell, and then I'm going to play it a little more straight, a little more bluegrassy, and then in the third section, I'm going to play it with this cross picking. So you can kind of hear how all three came to be, and also works very nicely with bringing it all together and what I'm talking about in my presentation. <laughs> so, um, And what we're also going to do is we're going to change keys in, in the song as well, just to make it more interesting. So George Shuffler is this gentleman down here. On the left, he played with the Stanley Brothers. Later on, had his own group uh, as well. Um, some of the people on the top that I want to mention uh, on the top right is Don Reno. So Don Reno is an extremely uh, talented musician, a virtuoso of both the banjo and the guitar. And um, what ended up happening was, history-wise. Um, Don Reno was actually first hired to go and play with Bill Monroe, but he got called to the Army. And so he went off to war. Earl Scruggs then got hired to be the banjo player. And Earl Scruggs became very popular and known for the three finger style banjo. So Don Reno wanted to make his own style to then sound different. So he played a lot of single string kind of stuff. But what he also did is he took that same idea and did that on the guitar as well. So he played a lot of what we would know today as flat picking or doing a lot of single string picking individual notes very fast. Um, and uh, so it, if you're interested in gu guitar playing, there is he recorded one guitar album that was like lost in the vaults and never released and they finally found it and released it several years ago. And you can find that on YouTube and, <laughs> and so forth. Um, the next two gentlemen to the left of Don Reno are, are very interesting because they have something in common, and it's the guitar. So the gentleman in the middle is Clarence White. Uh, Clarence White uh, was an amazing guitar player as well, excellent rhythm player, uh, one of the most amazing flat-picking bluegrass guitar players you'll, you'll ever hear. Uh, he later went on to play in the birds and developed uh, a first type of electric guitar as well, uh, which Marty Stewart now owns. And after playing many years uh, with the birds, he went back and him and his brother had a bluegrass band again. Um, but just um, the stuff he did on the guitar was amazing. And then in the top left is a gentleman named Tony Rice, 
who ended up buying Clarence White's guitar when Clarence White uh, tragically died in a, a car accident. Um, and so Tony Rice has that guitar. Um, and Tony Rice basically took what Clarence White was doing to the next level. Um, and is just um, an amazing and so well respected uh, back in his time for his singing, but also for his guitar playing, which is just amazing. He was a, um, an extremely powerful rhythm guitar player and uh, the most amazing lead guitar player. Um, and then uh, I shamelessly had to put in the bottom right hand corner my musical mentor <laughs> uh, by the name of Charlie Waller. Um, my guitar playing and style really comes after him. So uh, I am not one of these um, guitar virtuosos on the top. I do not do a lot of flat picking. Um, we had mentioned earlier in the slides that there are different styles of guitar playing. Um, one of them being deep bass notes, a lot of bass notes, um, and rhythm. So that is more my style of playing. Um, and I do, I will put a lot of runs and so forth in songs and so forth while I'm singing. Um, I don't take a lot of guitar breaks, honestly. Um, What's a break? You, you've used that word a couple times. I will show that in just a few minutes. How's that? You're helping me out. Um, so, um, and this is just my opinion. This is not re reflect the opinions of anyone else. I will take, um, ha I play the bass as well, and a little bit of the mandolin. I will take a strong rhythm guitar player over a fancy lead guitar player any day, uh, especially in a band setting, um, because the bass player and the guitar player are the rhythm. If you have someone who can play both flat picking and is a solid rhythm player, awesome. But if I have to pick between the two, being a musician in a band, I'll take a solid rhythm player any day. So what does that mean? So that means someone who uh, is obviously in time, in tune. Um, someone who knows how to put emphasis in a song. Uh, someone who knows how to pull back when it's time to pull back in the volume of the guitar. Uh, and I want to show that a little bit. I'm not going to take a break in the song, but I want to sing a song that has some guitar runs in it where I emphasize, where I'm playing a little louder, a little softer, um, because that's important in a bluegrass band or in a band in general. Um, the other thing you'll notice, uh, if you watch bands, there are times <laughs> when a lead singer is singing and a different instrument is sort of, seems like they're playing lead behind them singing. And well, that's to make the, sound, the song sound more interesting. Um, and the guitar player's job is to help drop in little things here and there to emphasize the song, to give it more color, more contrast, a little more beauty to it if you can think of bluegrass as beautiful. I do. Um, so I'm going to play a, a Gordon Lightfoot song, actually. And if any of you like Gordon Lightfoot, he's going to be uh, in the area this summer. Yeah. Right. yeah. Really uh, he's going to be... He's going to be over in Bethel Woods, actually. Yep. He's going to be there two nights, because I think the first night sold out already. Um, so this is a song called Redwood Hill. Um, in the song, if you were to listen to the recording, or shameless plug here, see Redwood Hill. The other two. Um, playing this live, you'd have the, the banjo and the mandolin taking the breaks, but the guitar and the bass are the rhythm, and they're singing and, and the harmony and so forth in it. So I just want to play a little bit. Actually, I'm going to play the whole song. Um, and I'm just going to play rhythm and, and sing. I'm going to put in some little, what I call licks, which are little runs, little notes to help emphasize the song. Okay. I climbed the Redwood Hill Was on
not change for any man. I try to comfort her, but she could not be still. And how the rain did fall as I found my way back down the river hill. Crying, who she was, she did speak these tender words. The thing. You know, a couple of the things as I'm singing that song and I'm singing the lead, I'm just strumming. But I'm emphasizing the bass notes. And those bass notes on the guitar are similar to what yeah. Lillian is doing on the bass itself. So I try what, to keep away from it, but <laughs> yeah. sometimes we play the same note. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, um, for example, Lillian is hitting, when we're in the key of A, she's hitting an A note and an E note on the bass. Well, I'm doing the same thing on the guitar. So in between my strumming, I'm hitting the A note and the E note. So I'm emphasizing those notes. When I'm singing the lead, I'm strumming a little softer. And then I add a little emphasis in between those lines. That helps give it a little more drive, a little more contrast, a little more interest. Uh, when I get to a certain point, I, you know, I put in a lick or a run, as we call it, a bluegrass. So, so you have these these little um, slides. They call them hammer-ons, pull-offs. They're all these things you do manipulating the strings, basically, that we call in bluegrass runs, uh, to help again give some interest to the song. Um, so, in that particular case. I'm, I'm not playing lead taking a break, which means I'm not playing the melody on the guitar like the banjo or the mandolin or a fiddle might or a dobro in that song. Instead, my job is solid rhythm behind all those things and to all work cohesively um, to add that interesting contrast. Um, and I think that that takes... Um, finesse, honestly. Uh, I think it takes practice and it takes taste. Um, and I think that's part of the difference from what makes a good, great, a good guitar player and a great guitar player is the ability, not necessarily to hit 5,000 notes uh, in a minute, but to be able to add variety and texture to help make a song sound more interesting, to, to help be the base foundation. The two of us are acting as the foundation of the group in the end. While other instruments are taking breaks, or the guitar is taking a break. Uh, for example, I mentioned that Tony Rice, who was a, uh, and is an amazing guitar player, um, and in his band he had two guitar players, uh, himself and his brother. And if one of them wasn't taking a break, the other one was and one was acting as the rhythm guitar player and one was acting as the lead guitar player. So even Tony Rice, who's you know, arguably one of the most amazing flat top guitar players, rhythm guitar players there has been, uh, understands the importance of having a good solemn rhythm guitar playing in the band as well. Um, so that's one of the things that I, wa that I wanted to mention. So anyone have any questions? Yes, sir. I only uh, began to observe bluegrass when uh, this group was doing concerts at, uh, at the church I was associated with. But I grew up in terms of appreciating music in the, from the mid 60s to the early 70s. Mm -hmm. Folk, rock, pop rock. 
who would you point out, not for their fame or how much money they made, but for the quality of the guitar playing in, in that era, a few maybe. I, I, I always thought Eric Clapton, to name one, and maybe I don't know enough I got the top guitar playing to, to be correct in that. I guess the I guess the question is is are we talking bluegrass or are no, we talking just mu just music in general? Um, I, I use the words rock and roll, but sure. Uh, let me think about that. I well, uh, to me, part of good guitar playing is also being distinctive. So, uh, one person that comes to mind was. That would not be considered necessarily uh, a virtuoso on the guitar, but he helped create a sound for someone. And I'm thinking Johnny Cash's band, actually. So you had this guy, Luther Perkins, who, oh, yeah. who came in, and he's doing this, basically this, I'm sure many of you have heard Johnny Cash music, but, you know, he's doing this. Well, that's, you know, that's not necessarily amazing, but it helped create a sound for somebody. Um, and that is part of what made Johnny Cash Johnny Cash, is that sound that was created. When I think of excellent guitar players, I think of uh, Carl Perkins, um, who was a great rhythm guitar player. Now, again, he's playing electric guitar, not... Um, not an acoustic guitar, but he was an excellent uh, at playing lead, taking breaks in songs, as well as doing some great backup stuff. He actually toured with Johnny Cash in the, the 70s. And if you listen to a lot of those live recordings, Carl Perkins is the one in the background doing a lot of the fancy stuff that you hear on the guitar while Johnny Cash is singing. And it, he was very tasteful. Um, so those are a couple people that, that definitely come to mind um, right off the bat. If I look at um, bluegrass music, there are a lot of um, people who are forgotten. And I'm, I'm going to take Charlie Waller, for example, who was my musical mentor. Um, because he was one of many, and he represents many people at that time. He was, he was not uh, fancy um, by any means, but he was distinctive. And if you ask many um, famous guitar players of today who was a early influence, they will mention him. He did do uh, some breaks on the guitar, um, but he was primarily a rhythm guitar player and a singer. He let the rest of the band do that. But he was also um, a showman, as was the band. Um, you know, they would do stuff where he would, they would play behind their backs. They, uh, he would uh, be all over the stage. He'd have the guitar up in the air because back at that time, they're all singing and playing at one mic. So he was very animated uh, in what he was doing. So, and he was a solid rhythm guitar player. Um, if we look at uh, music over the last 30 years, it, it's hard not to recognize a gentleman by the name of Del McCurry. Um, and I've had the good fortune being able to play with folks who played with Del McCurry and his touring band. And they say he's the most solid rhythm guitar player you will ever get to play with because he does a lot of those things I just mentioned. Um, his timing is great. He's tasteful in what he does. When he's singing lead, um, he's barely strumming the strings. In between those lines of when he's singing, he hits it, and he hits that guitar hard. Um, when the banjo comes in, everyone digs a little deeper into the microphones. They're putting a little more push. He does the same thing. He, he adds those runs and those licks that I talked about on the guitar in between um, verses in the choruses. So it, it, again, it's about taste, taste and timing uh, to me. So uh, those are some people that, that come to mind. But, um, you know, the other thing uh, to mention is, is, is we got some different styles of strumming. So obviously with any kind of music, you've got your 4-4, um, which is your 1-2-3-4 kind of kind of strumming. And then you got what we call waltz time, three-quarter time, six-eighths time. And so I thought we'd do a little song about that's got that in it as well. Um, and uh, just to... 
show you the difference. So obviously we got um, your regular strumming, like I was doing before. Wait a little, raise it with me. And then you've got um, this waltz time, this three quarter. I left my old home in the Rambles country. My mother and dad said something to go wrong. Remember that God will always watch over you. So a couple different things. Obviously, we got a different rhythm style in there. We got the waltz going. I did a little different kind of strumming in there as well. So we got this waltz going. And then in between one of the lines, I had a little different kind of strumming. Just to, again, taste a little different, make it more interesting, add different layers to it. So that, that's, that's what I like. <laughs> so, is, yes. is that, is that uh, the choices that the rhythm guitar player plays? Is that does that is that what he brings to the table when he's playing a band and he's basically create, creating that, or does the head of the band or the lead guitar help decide what gets played? How, how much of this is improvisational? How much of it is sure. not? Things like that. Complicated answer. <laughs> uh, I'm going to sound like an attorney when I say this. It depends. <laughs> so I would say it depends on the group and what each member brings to the group. So I, again, I, I mentioned that I also play bass. So I, I get hired to play bass a lot in, in bands as well. So I've been able to observe how different bands operate uh, based upon just my own experience. So. Uh, I'll, I'll just take the guitar for example. So again, you have some guitar players who can do and have the ability to do a lot of that lead playing, be able to pick out the melody as one of the instrumentals in a song or play a guitar instrumental. Um, you have others who have the ability to do that but choose not to and choose just to play rhythm and you have those who do play just the solid rhythm. 
So I, I think it depends on the group and obviously what their abilities are. But the person and then, with them making the choices that you're talking about. Sure. So for me, when I'm playing uh, the guitar in this particular band, I know uh, what I'm good at and what I'm not so good at. And so obviously I tend to choose then the things that I feel are strong and tasteful in, in the band. Um, I'm sometimes told that I play too too loudly. <laughs> Only by the bass player. I don't know well, why. Only when you're standing like right here. <laughs> I can't hear the people that are playing in front of you. <laughs> so when when we're playing, um, you know, obviously we rehearse, we go over some things. Um, there are certain uh, instrumentations in a particular song where we are working collaboratively. On you know this is sort of the the sound we're going for. Hey, can you try this? Let's do that. That sounds pretty good. Let's go with it. And you know, and then at times it can develop from there. And other times it, um, especially when you get playing with a particular group or people for a certain amount of time, it's almost like you could read what they're gonna do um, because you you get to have that collaboration with them. Um, so it's almost like. Um, you know, you can finish someone's sentence when you know them for so long, you know what they're thinking. Well, it's the same kind of thing musically. So, I, you know, there are times when we're playing, I, I just have this inkling. I know what Lillian's going to do on the bass for a run. Um, and it helps that I'm a bass player as well. So, you know, I will then at times either try and mimic what she's doing, so we're both doing the same thing, or I will lay back and not do those deep bass runs on the guitar to let her do it on the bass. So, uh, you know, again, it, it comes down to everybody taking their little piece and their little part to help make it sound, obviously, sound the best. So, and then at times, uh, you know, you're totally winging it, and, it, and you're there and you're playing on stage, and this sounds great, and you know what, I'm gonna, I'm gonna nail it and do this, this run on the guitar, or, you know, I'm gonna take this break tonight or yeah so it, it depends so there are songs we do um, that I do take a lead break on the guitar um, there are some most songs I'm just playing the rhythm and doing exactly what I've talked about so I don't know if that answers your question hopefully I'm trying to figure out where the decision making is made or how the decision making is made how much of it is sort of your Decide when to when to go loud, when to go soft, when to do a run or whatever okay. is your decision, the band's decision, the, the the lead guitar's decision. How how that sound gets created or has sure. Those so I I'm just going to take a, let's take a particular song for example. It doesn't matter which one. Okay, we decided we're going to play the song. All right, let's go through it a couple times. Let's. Let's play it, let's sing it, let's figure out the vocals. Because if the vocals aren't there, anything we're doing isn't going to matter anyway. And then, as we're doing that, we get a feel for the song. And so I know the banjo is now going to take the break here. They're going to kick off a song, and maybe they're going to end it. And then the mandolin's going to take the next break. And okay, the fiddle or the dobro, or maybe the guitar is going to take that break. And then what I'm doing is... Most of the time uh, in this group, I'm, I'm singing the lead, but even if I'm not singing the lead, I try to do the same thing. I lay back when the person is singing. I then put an emphasis in between lines and emphasis during breaks. I'm a little quieter on the mandolin breaks because the mandolin is typically a quieter instrument. We all typically, what we call, lean in a little more, get a little more gritty, push a little harder when it's the banjo because it's naturally a louder instrument, a little more drive. And so that's a, a, um, a typical formula, but it's not the be-all, end-all. So when I'm there singing a song or someone else is singing, those are the things I'm thinking about. What can I do to help um, be a foundation for the song but let the vocals shine. It's not about the instrumental. That's why they have instrumentals, where we then take breaks, and that's what it's about. So when I'm thinking of a song that someone is singing and there's harmony and things of that nature, I'm trying to, to, to dress that song to support the singing. 
so that's where I come in with those licks and um, you know the emphasis when I'm strumming louder when I'm strumming softer um, it and that is one thing you know I'll mention that Del McCurry does very well that's why I said when he's singing lead he's barely touching those strings strumming the guitar but in between those lines or when someone's taking a instrumental break on the song he's hitting that thing hard and that's what makes a song more interesting. That's what gives it what we call that bluegrass drive. So here I'm at the end of this, this verse or end of this chorus, and now we're all coming in and we're punching into the mics, and now I'm going to hit it harder. All right, I'm back to singing. I'm choosing now to, to pull back and, and soften up. So. so he makes the decision. I think that's, that's the, the answer, answer that you want. I was just answering the question. You're describing a collaborative process. Yeah. What you're describing, as opposed to sort of a band leader directing people, you know, sure. to do this or what you do. Yeah, sensibility. Right. Uh, Let's go to E. <coughs> so this has um, a little more street picking, and it's got cross picking in it. It's actually a Gene Autry song. called Ages and Ages Ago, we're going to do it in E. Thank you. 
Under the Double Eagle, that was called, and which was a, actually a famous marching band song that somehow made its way into bluegrass in, uh, in the 60s and so forth. And I had to do the little sliding run there. For... That's, my little, that's my little uh, signature. <laughs> but anyone have any questions? Yes? So I think of bluegrass as being from like Tennessee and Kentucky and east okay. of that. But they had guitars west of there. Mm -hmm. Like, did they have a distinctive style, or did they go in a different direction? Like, how would you characterize? Um, not that. Some. I thought somebody was going to say something. Not. I don't think necessarily. I think it. A lot of it had to do with culturally what was going on at the time and musically. Um, so you just. I'm, I'm thinking a lot of it may have been Celtic. Heritage from the Scots Irish. Sure. A lot of fiddling music. And yep. Which is how a lot of it got started. I mean, bluegrass was really born out of Irish music in, in many senses. And then, you know, the, the banjo playing um, came from African Americans and Africa and, and so forth. And all that became like the melting pot, honestly. And that bluegrass sound developed over time. And, and I think naturally, a lot of that happened more towards the east because that's where more people were settled uh, during the early part of this country as well. So it just had to do historically, culturally, you know, what was going on at the, at the time. Uh, yeah. It, it was a Saturday night entertainment because TV, the, the TV reception was really bad. <laughs> it was. There was only one channel at that time. <laughs> it was called Live. <laughs> Anyone else have any questions? Would you say that if you call bluegrass country music, that's an insult? Yes. Um, Is there it's a See, everyone has their own opinion on that. Ask for Pete's cash. Talking about now or a long time ago? <laughs> Back then. It was all one thing. It was all one thing. So it started that way. Where did the distinction, where did the bluegrass is, you know, totally different from what's happening now? Um, well, I think part of it had to do with the instrumentation at the time. Um, and so obviously uh, country bands slowly started weaning out banjo, uh, but kept fiddles. Uh, country then, which originally banned drums, started then have drums uh, playing you know the earliest johnny cash recordings for example did not have drums but there's a snare drum sound why he liked the sound of it he put paper in between the strings of his guitar and did that so it's it's those little nuances that started to then kind of separate the the sounds of the two you know and obviously bluegrass has stayed uh, more traditional to acoustic instruments, where the country, you know, started adding electric instruments and so forth. And you can listen to some bands, especially uh, in the 60s and 70s in, in bluegrass. Uh, not that bluegrass musicians aren't always starving, but they were desperately starving at th that time because uh, the folk boom was big. Rock and roll was also coming into play really big. Uh, and so they were trying to etch their own way into concerts and venues and so forth. Um, so uh, there's a group called the Osborne Brothers who are um, amazing with their vocal harmonies. That was their focus, vocals. But what they ended up doing is they tried to cross over. We want to appease the bluegrass people, but we also want to try and make it into the country because we want to pay the bills, honestly. So they started then on their recordings and so forth having the traditional bluegrass instrumentation, but added in steel guitar, added in drums. So they were trying to do a, you know, a crossover thing to appease both audiences. So I went far off of your question, but. <laughs> yes. How strong is bluegrass here in the valley? Um, I was just surprised yeah. hearing that yeah. here. <laughs> I, the, what I always find interesting is you'll you'll go to these little jam sessions and or and so forth. Or you'll come across someone at a at a garage and oh you you listen to bluegrass oh you play bluegrass oh I do too. So I I think that um, bluegrass has gained interest um, 
over time. It's interesting to see uh, the audiences, you know, because um, in, in the band that I play in, we play from Canada to way out in Missouri to down south, you know, the, in different areas, the audience is a little different. You know, so that when I'm up in Canada, it's a younger audience. Um, they really appreciate the acoustics, uh, which is which is interesting. And um, so I, I think that uh, there are more people around here play it than we probably realize, uh, or certainly listen to it. I know, you know, just growing up, I know a ton of people who who used to go to festivals all the time because we have a lot of them around here. So, yes. I would just point out a partial answer to your question. It's the Hudson Valley Bluegrass Association that, that's, that's sponsoring this particular program. And um, we've been pleased to see, I mean, part of our mission is to spread the word about bluegrass, which is fairly down in the food chain as far as popular music goes. Um, but I know we've been really pleased over, over the years at the, at the the people who come in and say, oh, you know, I've always wanted to play instruments with other people. I thought I was just by myself. Um, we have jams, open jams, twice a month, first and, first and third Wednesdays of every month. And people show up from all over. Uh, and in fact, we, lately we've been holding them at the manor uh, at Woodside. And <laughs> I remember one evening, there was an old guy who was a resident at the manor who comes in with his wheelchair and he's got 18 harmonicas with him. <laughs> he jammed with us. It was wonderful. Oh my so, uh, you never could, I, I'd also want to point out, you were, there was a question about the, the regionality of it all. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things about the modern age is that there, it crops up in unexpected places, like Japan. There's serious bluegrass music oh, going on in Japan. Good. And Alaska has a huge bluegrass scene. California, now, Washington, D.C. is always, well, Washington, D.C. is basically in the South. Yeah. But they've always had a very strong bluegrass uh, connection. Anyway, first and third Wednesdays, anytime. Just look on our website. I know where they are. And you're welcome to drop in and just listen to we, yes, we also have a couple concerts coming up. My mom always said her favorite music was hillbilly music. Is that just another word for bluegrass, or is that? We don't say hillbilly. Yeah. <laughs> 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 that just politically incorrect. I mean, hillbilly covers a spectrum. Yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, hillbilly was what Billboard used to call it back in the late '40s and early '50s. Well, that's what there's I'm talking about. Before it was called country and western, there was a genre of music. First, it been called folk music, and that's what the chart was called. Okay. It was called hillbilly music. Um, and for the reason you were about to allude to, that was considered derogatory, and actually <laughs> dropped in favor of country and western, but the country. But um, in a day when hillbilly prevailed as a term, it included a variety of music and including bluegrass. It was mm -hmm. Before bluegrass had sort of begun to separate, keep yeah. mentioning a little while ago, how bluegrass began to kind of gradually become very sort of a distinct form of music, and it's, it was viewed as separate from country. But in the day when hillbilly music was what the music was called, it was, I think, still part of that, that stream of music. Okay. So like for, for example, uh, just off of that idea, uh, we have what we now consider old-timey music uh, at times, which is you know sort of claw hammer style banjo playing, fiddle, things of that nature. So that was under that huge umbrella, hillbilly as well. Yeah, we're, uh, we're out of time. I was just getting warmed up. Ah. <laughs>